spanning the globe to bring you the constant variety of sport, the thrill of victory, and the agony of defeat. The human drama of athletic competition. International Speech Contest Workshop. As I said just a couple moments ago, this evening is all about you. Uh, I want to congratulate Sue, Bob, and Pete for coming out tonight because it's going to give all of us an opportunity to help them really refine, hone, or revise their speeches so that whether they've competed already in the club contest, looking forward to going on to the area and beyond, then we can help them, I think, achieve some of the things that they're looking to do in the International Speech Let me briefly walk you through what's going to happen tonight. If you're looking at your agenda, JP, who's our Vice President of Education, John Beckel, I'm going to introduce Virginia Bosterman, and Virginia's going to walk you through the judging criteria. But let me back up. Is everyone familiar, really, when I say familiar, are you really familiar with International Speech Contest? Is everyone really familiar with it? Okay. For Roger and Bob, let me what you may or may not know about the International Speech Contest. So just a little quick um, kind of summary of it. The International Speech Contest is the only contest in the district that goes beyond the district. Every year when the International Speech Contest starts out, there are somewhere between 25 and 30,000 people who compete in the International Speech Contest. That is then narrowed down to 86 to 89 contestants which then is narrowed down to nine that go to compete on the world stage or the international convention. And those 25 to 30,000 people, of course, we're fortunate to have the world, current world champion of public speaking, District 30, Perez Vasila, who joined Toastmasters in 2010. His first contest was as an evaluation contestant, and he happened to win that back in 2010. And coincidentally enough, I happen to be the contest Toastmaster back in 2010 when Perez won the evaluation contest. And I said about Perez at that time, he had something very unique about him. And I still remember to this day being on the stage and said, Perez, your accent is going to be your asset when it comes to speaking. And that certainly has come full circle in him being crowned the world champion of public speaking. It all starts in our clubs. Because a lot of times, excellent speakers never make it out of the club for one reason or another. If we make it out of the club, depending on how strong the folks are in your club, and you make it to the area. So now we're getting to a little bit more competition. And then we get to the division. Now you're upping it again. You're competing against Toastmasters, sometimes who are more seasoned Toastmasters, and have been in multiple contests. And then, of course, we advance to the district. The great thing about the International Speech Contest is, just like it is for Prez and the previous uh, world champions, is that you get an opportunity to speak for 450 seconds, or 7 minutes and 30 seconds, to deliver your message literally to the world. None of the other contests give you that opportunity, because they all end at the district. Evaluation contest, table topics, and humor speech contest start at the district. So I want you to think about this this evening and your message as Sue and Bob and Pete deliver their message. And we all think about the messages that we want to share with one another. If you were given the opportunity to be on that world stage, the message that you have already written or not written, is that the message that you really want to share with the world? Then I'll put it in a spiritual sense, is if you had 37 minutes and 30 seconds to talk to God, is that the message that you would deliver to God? Because some of the speeches that you hear at International, they are just absolutely amazing for any of us who've been at the International Convention. They just kick it up a whole different level. And they come truly prepared. So that's what the International Speech Contest is all about. I'm going to call up Virginia, but let me give you a little bit of background on Virginia. You've already heard she belongs to three different clubs. She's also a distinguished Toastmaster. She did accomplish her DTM actually in less than three years. She's been a member of just a little over three years. And she was an area governor in the north. 
And she has certainly made a commitment and a dedication to Toastmasters because she, in her short time in Toastmasters, she's done a lot of different things to help out the different district. She's been a session presenter. In fact, last night at JSC, Virginia conducted a table topic session, which was really a carryover because Pete was at our table topics workshop that we did here at top. And so again, she was able to give back to JSC and share the information with them in preparation for her table topics. That said, let me call up Virginia Bossima and she will walk us through the judging criteria. Virginia. I'm so glad to see people here tonight. I was a little worried when I got up this morning and had barely opened my front door to let the dog out. It's a lot of snow up north. All right, how many people here have ever judged at, for the international contest? Oh, wow. So most of you are very familiar with the judging criteria. But we're going to look at it a little bit differently. We're going to look at the judging criteria as a contestant. And what should we be aware of when we're crafting our speech? And when we're analyzing our speech, where should we put the emphasis? So that's going to be our focus tonight. We're not going to do judges training tonight. So if you need to go to judges training, you need to do that someplace else. Okay? All right. So. How do the judges look at the form? How do, we, how do we get our judges trained? Well, we all use the same form. You can get this form, and I hope you all have them, from the Toastmasters International website. That's where I got it from. I downloaded it. Okay, so it's the official form, and on the back, it does have an explanation of the criteria, and we're going to be following along with that. But the judges here in District 30, I don't know if it's the same at all the districts, but District 30 is committed to having trained judges. You don't have to go to the judges training to do your, judge at your club contest, but to judge at the area contest, the division contest, and certainly the district contest. You have to have been to judges training within that year. You also have to have judged at an area contest and a division contest to judge at the district contest. So we don't want someone who didn't judge at all throughout the process and then suddenly be judging at the district. All right? And everyone is trained on this form. But there are no Toastmaster police who look at the forms when the judges turn them in. It's a it's a requirement in that we use them, but no one is going to make sure that they're using these numbers. Lots of people have their own way of doing it. They'll use slashes. They'll use some kind of a mark. But basically, we're hoping that everyone is using this form to weight the different areas. And that's what I'm going to go through with you. So we're going, if you look at the form, you can follow along with me. And if you kind of slice up the three segments of the form, and you'll see it down the middle section. It says content 50, delivery 30, and language 20. Those are the three basic categories of the form. And as you can see, content, 50%. So right off the bat, you have to have a really good speech, right? Before you ever look at your delivery, before you ever look at your vocal variety and your gestures and everything else, the content needs to be well crafted. Okay? So that makes sense, doesn't it? I don't want somebody up there doing a soft shoe and tap dancing around. I want someone who's going to deliver a great speech. So let's break these down into the categories a little bit. So the, con the content segment breaks down into three areas, speech development, effectiveness, and speech value. And as you can see, even within content, 20% goes to speech development. Again, 
we have to craft a good speech. So let's break down those actual categories. So content development is 20%. And the speaker is putting together their speech so that the audience will get something out of it. Remember, we're doing this for <coughs> the audience. So we want them to be interested, we want to teach them something, we want to tell them an important story, right? So that's where we come with our content. And the response is not just the response that the judge has, the judge is going to be looking around the room to see if people are paying attention. And I never really noticed that at a local contest, but last year and the year before, when I went to the World Championship of Public Speaking at the International Convention, in the semifinals, I periodically saw people, about a minute into the speech, pull out their iPhone and start doing things on their iPhone. The speaker, even at that level, had lost people. They were not interested in the topic. It's very sad, but it's very true. So that's something we want to make sure we're keeping everyone's attention. We want to make it interesting for them, all right? We also want to have great examples. So if we're, if we're telling a story, we want to have good details in there so that people can relate. If I wanted to talk about a trip to Spain, I should have been in Spain, and I should be excited about it, I should be enthusiastic and, and have lots of emotion about what I saw and what the people were like, what the food was like, what, what the towns were like, what the flowers looked like, for heaven's sakes. But I don't want it to be a travelogue. It's about my personal experience there. That's what we want to share in our speeches. All right, so effectiveness. Effectiveness is, again, the reception from the audience. That's what the judge is going to be looking for. They're going to be looking around. For instance, in the humorous speech contest, this segment is also there. If no one ever laughs once in a humorous speech, they're probably not going to win. Doesn't mean that it's stand-up comedy and they're going to laugh every 30 seconds, but it's something that you want to hear a little bit of. In the international speech, you want to see that people are really paying attention, that, that they're drawn in to the speech, all right? A lot of times, the speech will be so profound, you might even see people have tears in their eyes because it affects them so deeply. With present speech, as we all know, we were all drawn in and there was laughter. So it is certainly okay to include laughter in the international speech contest, all right? Did this speech relate to your purpose? In the opening of your speech, you do tell the purpose of your story. If I'm doing a story about living in Spain or going to Spain, then the rest of my speech should be about that. If that's what I've introduced. If you're going to share a, a, an experience that you had where you were totally frightened, you thought you were gonna die, and then you didn't, obviously because you're up here telling the story. What profound effect that had on your life. People should be really drawn into that. They should feel the fear. They should be relieved that you survived and they should be just totally impressed with how that changed your life. If you took the time to craft the speech and share it at this type of event, a personal experience like that, you wanna make sure you're drawing everybody in and that they are learning from it also. Okay. All right, so speech value, it justifies why we're actually giving the speech. It's something of value to the audience, right? What are we going to learn? What's gonna be our takeaway? What's gonna be our call to action because of this? Is it, it changed your life, is it gonna change my life? How? What am I gonna to do to have a similar experience? Turn my life around, overcome some obstacle. And again, we want to make sure that the speaker contributed to the well-being of the audience. That we helped, especially in the international speech contest, it's usually something I've noticed 
where it's inspirational in some sort, there's some lesson, life lesson that people are sharing. In Prez's speech this year, it was a simple thing about asking for help. Don't be afraid to ask for help. Simple concept, but a very interesting speech. Okay. So now let's move on to the next segment of the form, and that's delivery. Again, that's only 30% of the total value. And then that breaks down into only 10% for physical, 10% for voice, and 10% for manner. All right? So that's not, that's not high. And some people look at it and go, well, then I guess I don't really have to worry about that. The difference between <coughs> in first and second place can just be a few points. We've all got the Olympics started. The difference between gold and silver can be fractions of a second, right? It's not quite that tight in a speech contest, but we want to make sure that we are adapting and including all of this as we prepare our speeches. So the, the physical, what would the physical be? Well, it's how we are communicating the information, right? And how we are using our bodies to, to place emphasis. It would be using emphasis with your hand gestures, where if you're moving, if you're using your voice, anything that you can do to tell the story. You're talking about how something was up high, something was really small, whatever you do. And you know, think of Prez again. We all imagine the car. We all imagine the squeaky jack. Right? We all imagine the tire. And we, he didn't have a prop. We all used our own imagination because we've all had a beat up car at one point in our life. Okay? And so the other thing would be making effective use of the speaking area. In a room like this, the way it's set up, I don't have to walk very far to use the whole speaking area. But the further you go in the contest, the bigger the rooms get. And usually the bigger the speaking area is. The stage for the World Championship of Public Speaking is as big as this room. It's pretty cool with all the flags behind it. So those, they really have to work to use the whole part of the stage because there's audience all the way around. Well, we might as well start in our clubs. We might as well get used to moving when we're speaking, use it for emphasis. That's what that 10% is all about. And again, body language. So what about our voice? We, in our competent communicator manual, we talk about vocal variety. We change our cadence. We change the volume. All of this to make this story more interesting, but also to use emphasis again. Now, some people think that if they shout, they really get everyone's attention. Sometimes if you lower your voice, people will even pay more attention. So you want to vary that. But again, if you have a soft voice and you feel like no matter how hard you try, you're never going to be able to really change it, it's only 10%. Then focus on some of the other areas and make sure you get all your points there. Do your best, but again, don't stress about it. And also, can you be clearly heard? When you get up to district, by then you're using a microphone. So you just want to make sure that you place the microphone so you're not hitting it or bumping up against it. Okay? And again, the words that you select, which will come in another section, but remember, this isn't a, a speech where you want to impress everyone with your vocabulary. You want it to be understood by everyone. So you want to choose your language so that everyone can understand and appreciate. It's really important when you get to the big stage because you have people from all over the world and most of them, English is not their first language. Especially this year since it will be in Malaysia. I'm pretty sure there'll be more people from India and China than the United States, okay? All right. So delivery, your manner. This is where you're showing who you are. This is how you're, you're showing them how you react to something and how 
the, your story that you're telling affected you, where you put your emotion into it. If I wrote out a speech and I gave the speech, it would be very different if I gave that speech to Jerry and he gave it. It might still be an excellent speech, but the way we would deliver it defines us. We're going to put our touch on it, right? So this is where you show everybody who you are. And, and it shows the audience that you're confident and that where you're t going to get a good reaction from the audience. Right, so then the last, next part, or the last part actually, is language. Again, language is only 20% altogether, 10% for each. But remember, all these 10% add up to 50%. And again, appropriateness. Now, I don't think we have to emphasize the fact that you don't want to do something that's inappropriate or say something that's inappropriate. That's not really what it means. It really means that the words that you chose were the words that related to your subject. And just like your vocal variety and your actions, if I say that something is hot, I want people to really feel that it was hot. If I say that I really loved something, you should be able to feel that I really loved it. It was the best pizza I ever had in my entire life. I wanted to eat the whole thing by myself. As opposed to saying, oh, the pizza was about 14 inches around. It was sliced up into eight pieces, about two inches thick. It had all kinds of toppings. That gives you information, but it doesn't give you that feeling. It doesn't give you the words that just make the people see it, feel it, taste it, use all your senses. So word choice, again, is very important. And that, even though that's in the language area, again, it's from the top part too, isn't it? It's from that actual speech development. So again, we have to focus on crafting the best speech. And of course, the language that we're using, again, are word choices. Correctness. Again, that's an odd term. I suppose what I would say is that there's probably nothing that will upset a judge more than improper grammar. Because at this point, you should have written your speech you should have reviewed it, probably had another person or two look at it for those things that we might miss. So you want to make sure, if you haven't done that, to have somebody else read it and make sure that you're using the right tenses, that you're not flipping back and forth all the time, um, that you're consistent, okay? Because some judges are really, really picky about that. Other people, it's a place where they can give someone a few points, take away a few points from somebody else. And again, the words that you choose, especially if it's an odd word or a technical word, make sure you can pronounce it. That would be a really bad time to get stuck and have to repeat the word or restart the word. So we want to choose the right words and we want to make sure they're words that roll off our tongue, especially if they're unusual words. It's going to take away from the fact that you found that really cool word to describe something if you can't get it out easily. Okay? All right. So in summary, know the criteria. Take a look at the form. I've given the, I've printed them out and given them to everyone so that you can take it home and judge your speech. Look at your speech and see how you would judge it on paper. If you can, have somebody video you giving a speech. And then, you be the judge. Sit there and go through and see how would you score it. It's amazing if you put on the other half and you look at yourself on a video, you will see things that people have been trying to tell you that you didn't quite get. I was I'll tell you my own personal experience when I competed in the international contest at the division level, someone suggested that I do something different to jazz up the speech at the end. And I reluctantly did it. 
When I saw the video that when Tim posted it, I realized that I had made a huge mistake. Now, did it cost me the contest because I came in second instead of first? I will never know. And it doesn't really make any difference. But it taught me that I have to go with what is right for me. So if you've seen Prez's speech, if you've been watching films of the other world champions, you don't need to be them. You need to be you, and you need to be comfortable in your own skin and with your own delivery. Because if you go back and you look at all the different winners over the years, there are similarities, but there are vast, vast differences in style and presentation. Okay? So go through, give, see how you think your speech is, and then make sure that you're using the area when you practice, practice moving, <coughs> do all the things you're going to do when you do the speech so that you're <coughs> comfortable with it, and practice, practice, practice. That's all I can tell you. Yes, Bob. I'm a little confused at the end you were talking about correctness mm -hmm. and you said if there was a judge that really bothered. If my know. grammar ain't was so good mm -hmm. and there that might be a judge and there might be a judge who didn't like that. Absolutely. And I would look at him and says 10% and that's it. Exactly. Except for one thing. You might not have gotten every single point in every other area. So 10% can make a difference. I'm just saying, I'm bringing in the human right. judgment into this thing. Absolutely. And I have to believe that once in a while, a judge will lay heavier than what the percentages you said on oh, a point. Absolutely. And that's why I, I pointed out that this is, this is all we have to go by. We have to trust that our judges have been trained and that they are following this form. But in the end, even how they select the point value for each area is going to be their own personal decision. Right. One person can think that someone had wonderful movement and vocal variety, and another person might have found it irritating. I walked out of the World Championship of Public Speaking, and there were people saying, I, don't, I think the guy in second should have been first. Not this year with Prez, the year before. There's always going to be people that have another opinion. All we can do is do the best that we can and try to make sure that we're covering all these areas. People will be people. Gina. I was just going to add a comment related to that. And, and this is not to be a substitute for judge training, but the one point that was hammered home, a couple of points, is that really all you turn in is the bottom part. Absolutely. So nobody sees your tabulation, but also that Whatever rubric you use, whether it's you know marking somebody up from zero or down from 100, mm -hmm. use that same rubric for all. Don't change yes. what your methodology right. is yes. in the middle of a contest. Just if maybe you're a harsh judger and maybe you are going to grade, or grade rate grammar more heavily on the on the form or the ballot, but make sure that whatever you did, you do that consistently exactly. for that contest. So. Exactly. And this isn't judges training, but if you ever are judging, when I did judges training at the TLI back uh, in December, when, it, when I was taught, it was just the opposite of the way the form is done. Yeah. Yeah. I started with the first speaker on the end, mm -hmm. and then I folded it back, yeah, yeah. and then the next speaker, and the next speaker. So I was always just judging that speaker on their own. I wasn't comparing one speaker to another. The scores compare the speaker to the other. All right? And and that's important because the you don't want the last speaker to get more emphasis because it was the last speaker or the first speaker to rate them so high that now you have no room, but you need to come back and then look at that and go, well, was it because they were the first speaker overall that I still think that was the best one? Right? But again, it's done by people, and they're doing the best they can. And any other questions? <coughs> All right, well then let's get down to the meat of this. I don't want to just have bones here. We're going to get our meat on those bones. Yeah, Virginia's got the...
Uh, I'm the timer, so I yeah. didn't get to time myself. <laughs> you were on time. I was on time. <laughs> Do time me. Do time me. She's do time me. I'm don't time me. So, was that was that helpful for everyone? Because no matter how many times we look at that form, we sometimes are remiss and not referring back to it because the point that Gina brought up, depending on the contest and who the judges are, some judges may sway towards a certain criteria, a certain area. But the important thing is, hopefully, we want to believe that they are consistent. And I think in the district, I think we've gotten a lot better in judging. Because I remember back in 2008, 2009, etc., going forward, some contests, you would just shake your head and you'd go, there's no rhyme or reason for this. Because they weren't judging on the criteria. They were basing it more on subjectivity and what their own personal life was, rather than you know, not comparing each speaker, but in the criteria is based on the judging form. OK, here's what's going to happen now. Before we get started, I'm going to pass this out. Everyone, Seth, can you help me distribute those back, please? And you can just glance at this form. I don't want you to spend a lot of time on it right now, but after tonight, after our participants who've delivered their speeches, but when you go back to your clubs, <coughs> I want you to think about whatever your topic, your subject. Does everybody have one side? Uh, we need one more, Jerry, for Gina. When we get to our coaches, I don't want to call them panelists, but when we really get to our coaches this evening, it'll really become, I think, a lot clearer because if you look at this form, what is your message? And the thing to think about, literally, is what do you want your audience to think, feel, or do? And to be very clear in what that message is. And as the form, you know, as you look at that, it says write your message here in 10 words. Drill it down into 10 words. And if we think of Prez's speech, when he first delivered that speech, his message became much more clear later on because he kept refining it, he kept revising it, he kept editing, going to different clubs. In fact, I went to a Metropolitan Club Monday night where Perez actually gave a presentation, literally, and he said that he went to 50 clubs. 50 clubs. You want to talk about commitment and dedication to the process? To give feedback and then I remember when we were at the Niles Club and he was just debating little things because the farther you advance, those little things become a big difference. And one of those things, because you'll see it later on a clip, we're going to share clips with you from, all, from, from four or five years of the World Champions and then if we have time, if you all are up for it, I have Speak the Movie here and I would like to, sh to have you watch a part of LaShonda Rundle's who was a 2008 world champion in public speaking, the only second African-American woman to ever win the world championship of public speaking. But anyway, one of the things that Prez was, was thinking about when he had his jacket on and he's talking about changing the tire, well, you wouldn't change your tire with your sport coat on in your suit jacket. So then he was taking his jacket off, I won't take mine off, but he was taking his jacket off and he was thinking about the timing and then he was rolling his sleeves up. Well, he rose his right sleeve up, he rose his left sleeve up. What does that do? That cuts into your time. So he was losing valuable time. So we were at the Niles and he was practicing there and I said, Press, why don't you just roll up your sleeves because nobody's going to see it, you got your jacket over it. And then when he delivers that line, he says, you know, kind of like, don't these things always happen when you're dressed up? And then he takes off his jacket, folds it up, and the other little detail about that, again, you'll see it on the thing, is he used his jacket as what? Those of you who saw it. Tire. He used it, yeah, he used it as a tire, as the prop. That, that became his tire. But he explained, which I didn't even know this, in, in reference to using the stage area, it gave him an anchor point on the stage. 
because then when he walked back over, the coat was there, and then that was the tire on the side of the car. So those were just little things that he focused on. So this, again, is to think about your message, to, to, to have that very clear in your mind. What is your message? And to really hone that down. So take that home with you and use that, please. A little, little, bit, little bit later, because uh, we want to get into the speeches, I'm going to give you two other forms so that you can think about, well, you know what, Seth, let's pass it out now before we actually, because it'll help you. Because our coaches are going to talk to you about some of these things. And this is not the form we typically use. Because we're going to focus on content. And we're going to focus on delivery and the subsets underneath us. And I want you to use this form. You can write it on a separate piece of paper. But as you hear the different speakers, because then we'll... We're going to get feedback from some of you at the end, and so you can use that to make notes. And did it accomplish some of these things? Was the opening captivating? Can the opening be improved? And I want you to think concisely and clearly when you're giving the speaker's feedback to focus on a real strength, just one, and also an area for improvement, because this way it gives more of us an opportunity to give the individual speaker's feedback. Would that be okay? Yeah. yeah. Okay. And I think that, again, that will help you clarify your message as you're crafting your message. So now we are going to get into the speaking portion of the meeting, which is the part we've all been waiting for, especially our three speakers this evening. Before we do that, Nick and Val, Amy and John are our coaches tonight. And we're going to go through, we normally, if we would have had six speakers, we would have had two speakers, and then we have the panelists. And I think we're still going to do that, so, uh, and I'm going to do it alphabetically, so Bob will be first, Sue will be second, and then Pete will be the final speaker. The panelists are going to have, what did we decide? I forget now. Two. What, two, what did we decide? Two and a half each? Two minutes each. Yeah, two minutes each. Okay, so Nick will have two minutes, Val will have two minutes, and they're going to talk about content, they're going to give them feedback on content and delivery, and then while they're doing that, then Amy and John, when the second speaker comes up, it'll give them time to prepare their notes and their feedback, because the last time we did our session, it was sort of rushed, and we want to make sure that they have time to properly prepare their notes and give you real value in terms of the feedback. And we're going to do this just as if we were doing it in a contest. We're going to do the contest format. So I'm going to announce your name, your speech title twice, and then your name. I'm not going to tell, you know, because you've already done that in the beginning and we've been in a contest. It would be your name, contest title, or speech title twice, and your name. Okay? Jerry, and they also need the time for the speech? Yes. And I just said yeah, five to seven. Again, just like just like in contest mode. And as Virginia said in going over the judging criteria, whether you're at the stage, well, let me ask this. How many of you are at the club stage right now? Sue? Oh, sorry. Pete? Bob's at the club level. Okay, so, and of course, yes, Pete? Hey, Jerry, I was just going to, real quick, you're talking yeah. about what type of speech to give. Yes. An inspirational speech. Some people here remember my speech last year. Right. It was a great speech. I went to training. I've been to training. Right. I had people come up to me this day. Right. Pete, that was a great speech on burgers. <laughs> it was. It was motivating. I gave a great speech on how to grill a burger. It was totally inappropriate for what we were trying to achieve. Right. Nobody can remember who won that night, but they remembered my speech. <laughs> <laughs> so here's a fine sword of Damocles. You can give a great speech, but if it's not appropriate, you're not going to win. You're not going to proceed. All you got to do is tell them about Crow. And we're going to come back to that, Pete. I'm glad you brought that up because, as Virginia was talking about, especially, again, as our coaches will, will I'm sure, share, the one thing we want to emphasize this evening is about the message. 
because when you advance, especially beyond the district, just to get to district number one, but once you get to semifinals, semifinals can be a lot tougher than the actual final. Because, for example, Prez, in the heat that he was in, the semifinal that he was in, because Bridget and I were there and, and a bunch of us and others who were uh, at the convention, his semifinal, his semifinal was much tougher than his final. Because he admitted Monday night, he said, you know what, if I would have gone against those same contestants in the semifinal, at the final, there's four or five people that could have possibly beat him. That's how, and when Virginia talks about the difference between one point, it can be that close, and it could be in any one of those categories. Just one point separating the world champion and who places second and third. And I'll share something else with you after our speakers have presented their speeches that I think that you'll be surprised about, about the number of words that we use in our speeches. It will just, you'll go, wow. Okay. So, having said all that, our first speaker this evening, no, that's not how I'm going to announce it. Our first contestant this evening, Bob Sims. What you choose to see is what you get. What you choose to see is what you get. Bob Sims. My hands were frozen to the controls of the airplane. I was flying three feet above the ground, out of runway, and headed for a line of trees. I was going to die. But then I ran out of options. Or did I? How many times have we made decisions based on a negative point of view, like when we were angry? How did that work out for you? That day I learned that when I made a decision based on a negative point of view, I almost died. There's a Toastmaster, fellow Toastmasters, and our guests. It was a cold day, the temperature almost made 18 degrees. The sun was shining, and it warmed the runway, causing puddles to form where there once was ice. I walked out to the tarmac and inspected the aircraft. Everything looked good, so I climbed into the cockpit and made myself comfortable. Key in, managed to both choke out, and when I turned the key, the propeller started to turn. The in engine sputtered, and then it caught. It sounded good. I put in the choke, and I went out to the runway, and I checked for traffic. Looking good, I taxied out into the runway, and I brought in full power, and the engine came to life and it roared. The plane moved slowly at first and then it gained momentum. Faster and faster, 40, 50, 60 miles an hour. Then all of a sudden, these puddles, water came spraying up over the airplane and onto the windshield. I recovered, I looked at the airspeed indicator, 75 miles an hour, time to fly. I rotated the aircraft, picked up, and all of a sudden I heard a reduction in power. I looked at the airspeed indicator. It was going 75, 72, 70. At 63 miles an hour, this plane is no longer a plane. It's a rock. Not knowing what was happening, I leveled off a few feet above the runway and I looked down at my tachometer. I was at 3,200 RPMs. It was down about 40%. So, <clears throat> Now being out of runway, I looked up and I saw the trees, and they were coming at me fast. And I looked at the airspeed indicator again, and it was going down, down. I was running out of options. I grabbed hold of the controls, waiting for the inevitable to happen. I'm terrified. Be cool. This is it. Take hold of yourself. There's no way out. There's got to be a way out. I'm going to crash into the trees and die. Head for the top of the trees. 
So I rotated the aircraft, pointed the nose right to the top of the trees, yelling, come on, come on, come on, you sucker. As I passed over the top of the trees, I felt the landing gear brush against some of the branches. I leveled off immediately. I've made it. I've really made it. Airspeed. What's my airspeed? 64 miles an hour. One mile an hour out of falling out of the sky. I grabbed the radio, microphone, I said, Mayday, Mayday, Mayday. This is Piper Aircraft 7085 Foxtrot, declaring an emergency. I looked down at the flight office and everybody come running out and looked up at me. That was no help. I said, they just came out to see me die. <laughs> there wasn't much left for me to do at that point other than keep the plane in the air and pray a bit. After what seemed to be an eternity, I found myself on final approach, headed down for the runway. In front of me was a twin-engine aircraft. As I flew by him, he saw me and he waved off. What's going on here? Why am I passing up a faster aircraft? Something's not right. I landed the airplane and taxied over to the uh, tarmac and shut off the engine. I slowly got out of the cockpit, and I saw Jim come running towards me. He's my instructor. And I said, I'm okay, Jim. I'm fine. He had something to show me. We walked around to the front of the airplane. It was covered in ice. Ice covered everything. It was on the air intake to the engine. It was into the input of the airspeed indicator. <clears throat> it was the puddles. The puddles is what caused all of the problems. Then, <clears throat> then Jim said to me, Bob, what was your RPM? I said, 3,200. He said, why, Bob, at 3,200 RPM, you can fly all day long, slower, but safely. I knew that. Then why did I trust the faulty airspeed indicator? <clears throat> A while later, I realized that in believing in a negative point of view, I'm going to die. I believed in a faulty airspeed indicator that supported that point of view. How many times have we came up uh, with a decision based on a negative point of view to come up with a negative conclusion that supported our negative belief? Life provides for us both the positive side and the negative side of you. A famous comedian, Flip Wilson, once says, what you see is what you get. <laughs> you almost had it right. What you choose to see is what you get. This is close to said before, at the very end, I'm going to ask for some feedback from all of you, the ones that choose to, to give Bob some feedback. If you want to give him more detailed feedback, please write it down and give it to him after Bob. No, I'm still here. I want to give it to the water. Okay. Right. It'll be about 30 more seconds to do that, and then we're going to turn to our coaches this evening. But, no, no, let me back up. You can go sit down, Bob. <laughs> you're gonna sit up. Do I have to shake your hand again? No, you don't have to shake my hand again. You're gonna sit up. <laughs> Getting ahead of myself. We're going to allow our panelists, again, more time to put together their, their notes. So we're going to move to our second speaker this evening. Okay, everybody done writing their notes? All right. Before we get to our second contestant, though, just for the contestants, and when you're a contestant, the sergeant at arms, if you're using props, if you're using a chair, whatever it is, have the sergeant at arms, like for Bob's speech, have the sergeant at arms bring your chair, your stool, or whatever prop you might be using, and have it positioned for you. 
You as the speaker don't have to do that. If the lectern is in your way. I think Val and I, I forget, I think she and I were at some contest. Uh, this is going back probably a year and a half or so ago. And there was actually a table that was in front. All six contestants never moved that table. They went around it. And I'm thinking to myself, sitting there, I happen to be a judge, I'm thinking, why didn't, why didn't someone just ask the sergeant arms to move that table because it was obstructing, it was forming a wall for the speakers. But not one of the speakers asked the sergeant arms to move it. So if you want something moved, if you want it put on the stage, if you want an electric move, ask the sergeant arms to set it aside for you. Okay. Sue, would you like me to move the electric? No, it's fine. Okay. Right. Our second contestant, Sue has launched it. Five years. Five years, Sue has Walter. Where do you see yourself in five years? Mr. Toastmaster, fellow Toastmasters, honored guests, if you, and Pete and I have done it, have filled out that list of answers to interview questions, what question is going to be on that list? Where do you see yourself in five years? When you think about it, it's a ridiculous question. Five years ago, I had a decent job and had great benefits. But I was bored. I knew I had to move on to something else, but I didn't really come up with a plan. And then one day I got called into the conference room. Two bosses, the person from HR, the fourth horse, horseman was off in a different apocalypse, I guess. <laughs> and in half an hour, I was out the door with all the contents of my desk, unemployed at the height of the Great Recession. Five years ago, I used to do recreational shopping. If it looked cute, I'd buy it. Maybe I'd wear it once. If I saw a great recipe in a magazine, I'd write down all the ingredients and go to the jewel and buy them. Now, Pull up at 525 at Bethesda. It was Orange Tag Day. And if I need a recipe, I think of something in my head, and then I go on an expedition through my pantry and my refrigerator and see what I can come up with. Five years ago, I would see the usual suspects, the people you rode the train with, your people in the office, the people you rode the train home with. Same conversations. Now, I can't, couldn't imagine all the people I've met, the people I've met networking, the Toastmasters I've met, working in therapeutic horseback riding, the veterans, the children with disabilities I've met. I met Mike. Mike was an active, outdoorsy young man worked outdoors, had a great job. One day he jumped into the cab of a truck, whacked his head on an overhead toolbox. Did the same thing we'd all do. <sighs> Forgot about it. Until a few days later, he was in the hospital with a serious brain injury. And he went from this vital, active young man to a physical wreck. But I've seen Mike in a carriage behind a Clydesdale with modified reins, driving a horse, doing something physical and outdoors again. And while it's hard for him to smile, you can see it a little bit. Five years ago, I had that list you have on the weekend of the 427 things you need to accomplish or think you need to accomplish, the places you have to go, the money you have to spend, the this and this and this and this. Now, I have other opportunities. I was walking in the park behind my house one March. And it's migration time. And one of the birds that comes through here is a sandhill crane. Bird that stands three and a half, four feet high. The call will carry a mile and a half. And they come by in small flocks for some reason that these little flocks were coming through. They didn't keep going. They gathered. And 
and they kept gathering, and they kept coming, and they kept calling. <coughs> Before I knew it, there was five, six, seven hundred birds up there against the sun. There was all this amazing energy coming down. And then they began to separate, and their little flocks flew off, and before I knew it, I was standing out there, and it was quiet except for the occasional distant call receding away. And I thought, all those things I used to do that made me so busy, I would have missed an opportunity like this to experience this. I've never seen it before, I've never seen it since. Five years ago, did I see myself working temp jobs? Did I see myself walking through stores, taking stuff off the shelf, looking at it, and deciding I could put it back? Did I see myself standing in a horseback riding arena in the dead of winter? Did I see myself experiencing life at the, a different level? Where do you see yourself in five years? I don't know about you, but I have no idea. It will most likely be somewhere I never expected to be. But look me up in five years, and I'll let you know, Mr. Toastmaster. Okay, I'll give you a minute to make some comments, to write down, and then we're going to move to our coaches. And as soon as we do that, actually I'll ask Mr. Sims to come back up here in a moment. And then after the coaches, after they give the feedback for Bob and also for Sue, then we're going to take a quick, short break, and then we'll finish up with Pete's speech. Fair enough? Okay. Okay, Bob, would you like to come up, please? <coughs> Coaches, are we ready? Do I have to shake your hand? I just want to get a fist bump, I mean. <laughs> Good evening, fellow Toastmasters, welcome guests, and most importantly, Bob. Bob, I really enjoyed your speech. First of all, I like the fact that you told the story, and you are a very excellent storyteller at that. It was not only a story, but it was a real life story, and it was a near death experience. So you instantly, I know you captured my attention because I thought, what would I do and feel like if I was in your situation? But I like the way that you also used the story of how you almost had a near death did have a near-death experience, but you also use that as a way for us to take a look at how are we listening to either that good voice or that voice of reason. You compared it to the instruments in your airplane, which I thought was a really unique and creative twist on your speech. I really enjoyed that. I'm going to talk specifically about the delivery and the language you used. First of all, physical. I really appreciated the fact that you wore the outfit. You wore the aviator outfit. You had the hat on, the jacket. I was curious when you first came up. It was excellent. I like the fact that you had the chair to show us that that would have been the, the seat for the airplane. In regard to your voice, I would have liked to hear a little bit more vocal variety and a little bit more just when you said, down, down, or mayday, mayday, just, you know, this is your, this is your last call in life here that you're talking about. And I would have liked to have seen a little bit more of an intonation on some of those portions of your speech. The manner I also appreciated is that you did have a serious tone because it was at that point seriously about life and death. I also like the fact when you did the, the dialogue between the good voice and the bad voice that it was interesting and it put a smile on my face because I was almost anxious to hear what one was going to say to the other. In terms of language, I thought that the language used was appropriate. 
I really loved the questions that you started out in the beginning of the speech when you said to us, have you ever had a moment or have you ever made a decision? And I think every one of us in our mind was probably nodding our heads yes, and I could sense the audience was really drawn into your talk from the beginning. I would have liked to see a little bit more descriptive language at points, describing I was about to, it was the end, I, you know, my life is over, or just bring us into that emotional part of your speech a little bit more. Last but not least, be careful about some of the terms. You said tachometer, and you also said the airspeed indicator, and I, I kind of figured out what those probably were, but you might say for those of you that don't know aviation, a tachometer is A, B, and C, D, so that you don't lose us trying to figure out what you're talking about. But I enjoyed your speech, and I look forward to hearing your next one. Thank you. Yeah. Bob, I'm going to focus on the content, and Amy's mentioning of the story. That, that made the whole speech. It kept us engaged, and you could almost feel like we were in the plane with you, which is <coughs> sitting on the edge. Are you going to make it? Are you not going to make it? Those types of things. The one thing that I see is the one key word to your speech was the word choose. And I caught that at the end, but as the speech was going on, I was trying to figure out, okay, what is... What is he trying to tell us here? Maybe highlight that at the beginning also, because you did mention, you, you tied it together, but highlight a little better the choice so you can kind of wrap it all together. Uh, the airspeed indicator, 3200 3, RPM, I wasn't real clear where that came in to the picture and it might have been just you had so much material in the story itself that you didn't have time to give us non-flyers a little quick lesson that you could build into that. And with that, where do you find the time since it's such a short speech? The question that I ask for that is, what did the mention of the people coming out to the tarmac do to add to your message? I don't know if they added anything. So if you take that out, throw a little more about the airspeed indicator. Can I say something? Sure. <clears throat> First of all, <clears throat> I tried to do the dichotomy between the airspeed indicator and the tachometer. On takeoff, I forgot to say the tachometer was at 3600 RPM, full power, and gave thumbs up. Missed that totally. Okay. So I did not anchor the tachometer, and that's why you lost out on, on that. Okay. Um, <clears throat> back at the tarmac, the only person who came, uh, that I saw running was Jim. And Jim was, I, I used like a, a back and forth, where he was the one who told me, Bob, at 3,200 RPM, you can fly all day long. And that's when the realization that with the puddles. Did I say the puddles? I set the plan. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. So vocal variety. Um, boy, I, I gotta beef up the bottom. Which was okay. Very good. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, coaches. How about that? Thank you. And our coaches are gonna give the speakers their notes, so you've got more detailed information. Ms. Haswalter, if you please come on up. We can shake hands. Quick. Val and Nick. Sue, I loved your speech. You, you really had a lot of little stories woven in through your speech, and that's good. Um, what, what I would like, to, the way you opened up, where do you see yourself in five years? Uh, so that brought the audience into your story. It was a good question to ask. But then I was unsure about where you were going from there because you said when you fill in you, when you fill in that list, it's what list? And then I realized, okay, you must be talking about an interview and a resume. Which, so that wasn't clear at the beginning. Uh, one suggestion for that might be to start in an inter interview position where <sighs> that question again. 
and then uh, go through it so we understand what that, what that is or tell us. Your body, you mentioned five years ago quite a few times and you had that contrast between five years ago and now when you were working and what you're doing now. And I thought that was a nice way to contrast the, the working life of, of being so busy with things that you really don't have time for life. And now it seems like you're really enjoying life. Fuller. Yeah. And you mentioned a few things that you're doing now that you weren't able to do before. Professional shopper, the uh, looking at the uh, the uh, birds and the everything else. So, um, so I thought that was a nice contrast. What what I would like to do is you had some stories in there, but there was there were nice stories. There was not a lot of conflict in it. What you want to do is when you have a story is create that conflict, make us feel it. So. Oh, you said, well, I was uh, in a job and now I'm not a, I was unemployed. Were you happy about that? Were you sad about that? What, what happened? How did that make you feel? Well, we want to, as an audience, we want to see how you've changed personally, emotionally. We want to feel that emotion. So a couple of suggestions would be to build up the story and have that conflict and then have the resolution of how you're a different person now. You're living life differently. Um, and so suggestions is, what will you do, what, what will your speech do for me? What's, what's in it for me? What's in it for the audience? How, your message didn't seem really clear. I think if you just impact, you know, your, how you enjoy life more, and maybe you can too. And the other thing is to end with more of an action how you've changed, and how we could possibly explore that change. So how it will affect us as an audience. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Nick? Sue, so I, I, I'm going to speak, and I'm going to ditto a lot of what Valerie said, but from, from the physical perspective of your speech. I, I know I really liked your speech, because as an evaluator, sometimes you forget that you're evaluating. <laughs> and I looked at my notes, I'm like, oh, I haven't wrote much stuff down. And that's a compliment to you, because I got, I got lost in your story. I think your manner communicated, um, there was a softness and a kindness, and there was this reflective tone to, to your voice and your speech that I totally think you should keep. Because I, I think it, it was communicated that you've seen a new perspective, and I also felt like a, like a quiet confidence that it developed through this new perspective that you have in mind. To Valerie's point, it was a good story, but I, I thought there could have been a little bit more of um, like, like a next level up. Like for example, um, you, you made some good gestures. You talked about the gentleman who hit his head. Like you said like whack, like whack, you know, a little bit louder. Um, the hustle and bustle, you, you said the hustle and bustle, the hustle and bustle and, and move, more movement of the stage. And that way we get, well, she was busy. Because then we could really connect to that. Um, when you were talking about the birds, we, we kind of saw this, but try to imitate the sound of the birds. What exactly did they sound like? Because I think <laughs> that, that'll be like a, a funny noise that connects you to the audience, but also connects you to the story. Um, but just little things like that. When you were talking about Mike's smile, the smile, and then maybe a pause after that. So that way his smile sets in, and, and, and you describe them as vital. But you said the word vital, say vital, or strong, or gusto. So then we get an idea of what Mike's like, Mike is like. But those little ums in the story, I, I think would make the, the story great, but the core of it is very good. So I look forward to you building on it. Thank you. did uh, really hit on what I have struggled with with this particular speech. This speech has been torn up several times, um, getting into it. And it, the points that you brought up were the points that I've really been trying to work on. So we're on the same page. Thank, Thank you. you. All right. And now I think it's time for a short pause, then we will resume the meeting, we'll come back and we'll hear
Pete's speech. We'll hear from our coaches again. And then we have a couple surprises for you. And then after that, we'll give an opportunity to all of you to give feedback to our speakers, either verbally and or written. So we'll take a quick... Yeah, come back at 8.30. Name an effective political leader in history who couldn't speak well. Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. There aren't any. Because when it comes to a disease... Freedom like requires that, leadership, no and leadership requires parties. oratory. You have to speak to be heard. I have a dream. It's all about personal growth and guts. Never give in. Never, never, never. Welcome back, everyone. And now we're going to turn the meeting back to our facilitator, Jerry, and hear our third speech and get on with the rest of the Okay, welcome back everyone. We're going to move to our third speaker this evening. Our third contestant, Pete Russell. Chilling and grilling with Pistol Pete, food for thought. Chilling and grilling with Pistol Pete, food for thought. Pete Russell. Everybody, how you doing? Welcome to Pistol Pete's Backyard Barbecue Extravaganza. Grilling and chilling. You know what, today I kind of want to deviate a little bit. We're going to leave the hamburgers behind us. You know what I'm really curious to know? Who likes to go on an adventure? Where would you like to go on an adventure? To a foreign country? Which one? Malaysia. Okay. Why do you want to go to Malaysia? I want to see the World Championship of Public Speaking. There we go. How about you, Valerie? Where would you like to go? Somewhere where it's warm. Mm -hmm. Great! The Caribbean? That's good. Amy? I'd like to be back in Paris. Okay. Great destinations. A vacation as a simple adventure. You get excited. Your heart gets going. You're really starting to think you want to put this vacation together. You want to make it the best it can be. Now, what would you do if I told you? I could get you that vacation in one evening, and it's less than an hour from your house. I know what you're thinking. The drugs are wearing off. <laughs> the medications leave a pee. In reality, in less than an hour, by car, from where most of us live. You can't have an adventure. I'm not going to call it a vacation, but I am going to call it an adventure. You're wondering what that adventure is? That adventure is going somewhere different for dinner, dining out at an ethnic restaurant. We had Paris. We had Malaysia. How about Greece? The Greeks, the cradle of Western civilization, democracy, the Olympics, Hiros, Suvlaki, Opa, Saganaki, I can taste it already. I love Greek food. Well, maybe Greek's not on the menu. Maybe Nick prefers Italian food. You know what, in an hour, he could be in Little Italy. <coughs> Lo and behold, a variety of restaurants, most of the owners come from the old country. They've decorated their restaurant so that it looks like the area they grew up in, whether it was Venice, Florence, or Naples. And if you're really lucky, the recipes they use were handed down from his grandmother to his mother. And now he's cooking that same food from that region of Italy for you. How about maybe we heard the Caribbean? Maybe that's what we need to pick you up out of your winter doldrums. We need some Caribbean food. So there are plenty of great Caribbean restaurants. Mm-mm. I can see going into one now. Murals on the walls, palm trees. Oh, the aroma of jerk chicken, those scotch bonnets. 
burning your nose just a little bit to warm you up from the inside. These are all adventures you can go on. They're not big adventures. They're not expensive adventures. You don't need a passport. No hassle at the airport. What do they all have in common? We're getting to that. We've talked about all kinds of foreign food, places to go. How about something that's Americana? What food is strictly American besides the burger? Because you know I'm the expert on that. How about barbecue? Barbecue is strictly American. You won't find it in Europe. I can tell you that right now. It's not on their cultural list. Does anybody know the origin of barbecue? Origin of barbecue comes from the deep south. It comes from the time that this country practiced slavery. Plantation owners, intentionally to save money, gave the slaves the worst cuts of meat, the hardest to cook, the least flavorful, the toughest. What else did they give them? Beans. Beans are healthy. A lot of iron, a lot of fiber. How do you make a bean exciting? Please, how do you make a bean exciting? But these slaves, in true American fashion, found a way to cook this meat, make it tender, made it juicy, made it flavorful. And in 200 years, every big city's got a barbecue joint. Is that incredible? But how did barbecue make the transition from Afro-American, ethnocentric, to white America? I'm going to take you back to the South, to Jim Crow South, after the Civil War, late 1800s, turn of the century. Blacks had to have two jobs to survive. That second job, they'd have barbecue events. These would be held on Sunday after church services. This is before Weber Grills. This is before charcoal. What did they do? They did what's known as a pit barbecue. They would dig a trench six feet deep, three to four feet wide. However many people you're serving, that's how many pieces of meat you got to line up. Could be 10 feet long, could be 40 feet long. They would put all kinds of hardwood in the bottom of these trenches. Hickory, oak, pecan. They'd set these logs ablaze. Wait for the fire to die down. Be nothing but embers. Now it's time to put the meat on. Heavy duty steel racks. They put the meat on these grills. Suck them below the level of the ground. Covered this trench with wood. Left just enough space for the fire to breathe and the smoke to escape. And it was a long, slow cooking process because they started on Saturday and it was finished Sunday at noon for the big event. This was generally an all black event. Well, what happens when you work for the white guy in town? You're talking to your friend. What does the white store owner do? He overhears you talking about, man, that barbecue was great. What happened one Sunday? A single white family showed up to this event. Now I know when they showed up and got out of that carriage, there was dead silence. But it didn't matter. They wanted to have that experience. They wanted to take that adventure. And they took it. It doesn't matter whether it's Greek food, it's Mexican, it's Italian, it can be Chinese. Every time you dine out, you break all cultural barriers. You immerse yourself in their culture for that one, two, or three hours. You expand your horizons. You broaden your capacity to learn. And this is what you teach your children when you take your family to an ethnic restaurant. Food has done more to break cultural bias than all the legislation that was ever passed. Mr. Toastmaster. All right, you can step here, please. I'm going to grab my notebook. Okay. I'm taking notes. All right, go ahead. So give you a minute. Oh, wait. They're going to give me notes. Yes, they're going to give me notes. We'll give you a minute to write down some notes for Pete, and then we'll turn it over to our coaches.
Coaches, let me know. You ready? You ready? Okay. We'll get to it then. Hey, Amy. fellow Toastmasters, welcome guests, and most importantly, Pete. Pete, your speech tonight, chilling and grilling, food for thought, instantly got me curious and got my attention. I like the title very much. A quick summary of your speech. First of all, I really liked your opening. Who wants to go on an adventure? I think every one of us in this room would obviously answer yes to that and, and want to know where you're going to go next. I also like the fact that you use suspense in your speech. You said you could be on an adventure an hour from now, and I started thinking, okay, you talking about going skiing, or I wasn't, I wasn't sure what was going to be next in your speech. I also like the fact that you told us stories about cuisine, and you use interesting word choices. I, I wrote this down that you talked about the history of barbecue, and then you said that food breaks the cultural bias. I'm like, I have never heard that before, so that was, a, that was an interesting spin. I'm going to really focus more on your delivery and the language that you use tonight. First of all, physical. I like you have natural gestures. You use your arms a lot. One thing to be careful though is I notice that you have a tendency you kind of walk forward and you kind of walk back. And so it got at first I didn't really pay a lot of attention, but towards the end I started it just started distracting me. So a little rocky, okay. Right. So just either stay in one place or say a thought and then walk over to the other side and maybe say something else. The other thing that I like about the way you give speeches is you have excellent volume. You've got great intonation. Everybody, even people that are in the back, can hear what you're saying because you've got great vocal volume. Expand your horizons. You said that, and you also use a lot of intonation when you shared that thought. I love the manner that you give speeches. You have excellent enthusiasm. You're very high energy. You smile a lot. You've got a positive energy, so I think it just instantly draws your audience in. Appropriateness of your language, I like the descriptive words you use. You appeal to our, our senses of smell, taste, we, you know, talking about, thinking about the food that you were describing to us. And also you use interesting word choices I mentioned and good grammar. The only thing that I would share with you as far as how you change the speech a little bit is that if you're going to do this at the international stage, the one thing I think is missing is an emotional appeal. I mean, yes, we can relate to food as a, you know, cuisine can can break barriers and that's awesome, but what about your personal story? I mean, is there some time in your life you told a historical story, but what emotional appeal can you bring to the speech so that we are like, oh wow, I never thought of it that way. We want to hear more about what, what Pete's emotions are in the speech and I think that would take it up to the next level. Just to give you a quick you. heads up, thank yes. you by the way, that was great. I wrote that speech last night because the speech I was going to give. I didn't like it. <laughs> right. it. It wasn't inspirational we'll enough. Okay. And what I wanted to do, and I wasn't able, is I wanted to tie the food more to breaking the cultural barriers. I haven't quite. I got into it a little bit, but I, I need to. I need to cut back in some areas and kind of get in there a little bit more. How it really works and how it affected and how is it my story? It's my story because when I'm walking down the street or I'm driving in my car. And I see Valerie, and I'm thinking, hmm, I wonder where she eats Mexican food. I bet you she goes to the place where they really serve good Mexican food where her family's from. Or I see Amy. Oh, she's Greek. I wonder what Greek restaurant she goes to. Yeah. And that's what I think. Okay. I don't think, get out of my lane. Right. <laughs> <laughs> where do you like to go eat? Well, talk about, talk about that, or maybe a personal experience you had and how you and your life were able to break a barrier with somebody else. But I thought... The speech was very enjoyable. Right. Thanks, Amy. John? Right away you had me. My first thought is, okay, this is a Food Network TV show opening. <laughs> and their job is to get your attention so you don't change the channel. So I, I was really like that. The word adventure was intriguing. It, it, it's, it gets your mind going, okay, where are we going on this trip? You talked about the Greek and the food. You say the opa and the you know you can smell the cheese. You can, I want kasaki, but that's a whole other thing. The Italian, the decorations, the recipes. I've never heard an Italian ever say, "Oh, I just found this recipe." It's always from grandma or mom. Always, without doubt. <coughs> the Caribbean, the description of the place, the color. I felt like I was there. Um, I know there's a couple of barbecue people here who I think. Their mouths were watering, <laughs> picturing the food. I know mine was, and I don't know why I'm looking at you, so. The history of barbecue, 
all these things just shows your passion for barbecue and food and just the, the fact that you know the history knows that you're passionate about it and that's where your energy is coming from. That's good. Did you have the audience interested? You want to catch them at the the great line at the end, food has solved more bias than anything. Great closing. How do you get the audience, that opening to get you? Make a bold statement. I can solve most of the world's problems because of food. And I'm going to tell you how. Mm -hmm. And right away you're like, okay, where is this guy going with this? And then you go there and you tell your story and then you come in with the bias and it's just kind of slamming the door shut on that bold statement that you make. Okay. Good, thanks. Okay. Notes. Three years. Excellent. Mr. Toastmaster. Thank you, Pete. This is the really, really, really fun part now. For those of you that would like to offer our three speakers some feedback, I'm going to give you 30 seconds. I'm going to have Jen time it so we can give everybody kind of an equal opportunity. One strength that you'd like to share with the speaker, and then one tip, suggestion for improvement. So if Seth, if he wants to, I'll start with Seth and we'll kind of move around the room. But again, keep it to 30 seconds, please, because we have a couple other things we want to share with you. So are we doing Bob first, then come back to do Sue? And Correct. Then... Yeah, we'll start with Bob first, then Sue, and then Pete at the end. Okay. Bob, uh, one of the things that they kind of mentioned here just to point out, when you're doing a speech like international, definitely if you have a prop, get that set up because timers are informed. I mean, they mentioned just to do it as far as a management thing, the moment you touch anything, the moment you open your mouth, the timer starts. Which is? Both. You go to pick this bowl up, timer starts, in action. Because <coughs> we don't know if it's a prop or we don't know if it's part of your routine. So if you're going to use a chair, set that up right ahead of time with the Toastmaster Sergeant Arms so that way you're not falsely timed in your mind. The other thing is your big payoff, your main theme, you had this, was things aren't as you know, your perception of affects what reality is. What you choose is, is what, what you see. At. Yeah, what you choose to see is what you what you see. You had this big lead up with all the airplane and then a short payoff. It would have been nicer if you could have trimmed that down, and I'm sure you're gonna work on it, to trim that down so then you could tell us what your payoff was and then let us be able to as an audience digest that. Because otherwise Colin? Give the hug. Okay. Do you have any additional notes? Please pass it on to Bob. Roger, do you have anything for Bob? No. Okay. Rick? I kind of agree with Seth. You know, it's, I saw great value in the speech and how you closed it. What you choose to see is what you, what you get, as opposed to what you see is what you get. <clears throat> Somehow, that value can come out stronger during the speech. And the one place, too, that John brought up about the tarmac, I, I think he was referring to when the people ran out the tarmac and mm -hmm. thought you were going to die. I, I didn't quite see where that added a lot. Because in reality, the way I heard it was that you're flying, you really were, you really did have the speed. You weren't really crashing. Right. You only saw it was. So right. why were they coming out there to watch you die? So, I mean, that could, you might I'll be able answer, to lose I'll, I'll answer that for you. Because he chose to see it that way? <laughs> I'm done. Okay. They were going right. to a stop Thanks, car race? <laughs> yes. They only go there for one reason. He's <laughs> <laughs> correct. <laughs> All right, Pete, Pete will go move on okay. the side, Pete. And Real quick, I gave Bob some, but to get back to the people that came out to the tarmac when you were, you were a mayday, mayday. Instead of going in there and trying to radio you down to find out what was happening, you all ran out to see you crash their morbid curiosity. You should have had an aside. I'll show you and your morbid curiosity. I'm going to laugh. You, you could have just said that to yourself. And you, you, you could have, it could have been a very wry, dry, morbid sense of humor just to get you through it. I'll show you and your morbid curiosity. I'm going to laugh. 
and you're playing one up and one over the trees or whatever. I did get two laughs on it. <clears throat> I mean, they came out to see you crash, but I would have made a comment about it because then it pulls it back into the story. Mm -hmm. and, it, and it relates how you dealt with their morbid curiosity. Because okay. they really came out to see you crash. Okay. All right, thank you, Pete. Okay, good. I, I already Do you have anything to share about Yeah, I, I said my comments to the speakers already. So. Okay. Sue? So? Uh, I was just going to say, your story has enough drama to it, just taking your local variety a little bit, because you, yeah. you do not have an expansive style to start yeah. with, but just taking, you know, ratcheting it either down or Really? Oh, oh, wow. Wow. Oh, oh, so right you can do it. Oh, but that's all you need to do, because you, right your then. style is not over the top, except there. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Andrea? Uh, that was the only piece I was going to add, is, is the vocal variety. I only caught, you know, half or three-quarters of the whole story or whatever. You would have pulled me in a lot quicker if you would have um, used some ups and downs and uh, drive a few points I home drove, and pauses, maybe. I drove my drama teacher crazy in college. <laughs> <laughs> Make a face, Sims! <laughs> there you go. There, you're sad. <laughs> You're right. You're absolutely right. I, I have one quick one. When you're using a prop, you're using the chair as your airplane. You got in on one side and you got out on the other. How do you know that it doesn't have two doors? I don't, but I thought that was kind of odd. So you, you need to got make it. sure that you... Yeah, same. You're right. There's only one door, by the way. <laughs> Anyone else like to hear a quick comment? I would just say it's excellent. Um, potential with this speech, and I would say practice, practice, practice. That's going to be a great segue in a couple of minutes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yes. On your opening, you, the way you started, I was going to die. I was going to die. Use it there to be you know, nailed to full of sand. And I agree with the cockpit. Really get into it. Do you open a door? Do you sit in there? And then going through, you had a lot of narration at the beginning. You could have used dialogue going through your checklist. Instead of, I did this, I did this, go through your checklist. Okay, now, now I'm going to do this. Okay, now I'm going to do this. So uh, try well, I to have... That, I did that key. But try to have some dialogue there instead of all that narration. There's places where you can put a little more dialogue in. In other words, let us in your head. As you're going through your mental checklist, do it that way instead of explaining inner, it. The inner dialogue. And one last thing. Tell us what a checklist is, because a lot of us don't know anything about aviation. <clears throat> I've got to tell you what a tachometer is. Right. The tachometer, the airspeed indicator, and the checklist. Okay. All right, we need to move on. So now, feedback for Sue. So we're, this time we're going to start in the back there. Andrea, anything to share with Sue? Um, the one thing I noticed, and maybe because I'm a, a nurse or whatever, and some, about the, the guy... <clears throat> It sounded like a guy with a stroke or whatever, but when he was therapeutic writing, he had a slight smile. I thought that was perfect, and I did kind of notice a bit of a pause at that point, and it wasn't a huge smile, but it's like, oh, I get that. You know, you, ha you have to look carefully to see it, but it was there, so I, I just, I like that piece. Okay. Other comments for Sue? So I always love your speeches. I always love your use of pause. This one is flat. It doesn't have the pizzazz yet. Yeah, that one. Okay. Pete, anything to share with Sue? Actually, I gave it to Sue already. Okay. So, okay. Regina? Same here. Okay. Six, Rick? I just didn't, uh, well, I, the speech was good. All your gestures and everything were great. I really, I was memorized it. I was just looking for, from the opening, which was a great opening, and you repeated the question, and you had the greeting. Somehow I didn't get that takeaway value message very strongly at the end. I think it's there. I just don't know how you pull it together and in there, yeah. conclude it. Mm -hmm. Okay, Roger. Okay, Bob, anything to share with Sue? <clears throat> we had our contest yesterday at Mount Prospect. Table topic was, what is the difference between living and life? And that's where you came in. And <clears throat> at one point you were living and then at the other side, five years later, life versus mm -hmm. living. So maybe we we'll that up. This is a better, I'm not saying it right. I know where you're going, though. I know where you're going, Bob. 
you can always get some email. Existing versus or, living. Yeah. And email if you I know where you're additional going. thoughts come to your mind. I got right. It. That's, that's, that's good. Okay. Seth? You were pretty landlocked. If you could work the room, you start at your home position, here's my job. And then because of no longer having that job, here's my travels. So you could move to go, I was a, you know, <clears throat> shopper. Well, and then you, so you can move there. I could move to the park. You can move to the horse arena. And then where am I going to be in five years? You come back to where you started because it's kind of the interview question. So you work the room, start at one spot and come back. And really, your story kind of leads itself to like, there's a Toby Keith song, my list today. And you're talking about, again, living in life. So if I had to work, I missed out on all these things. So you could kind of give us that as the payoff, stop and smell the roses type of thing. Yeah. Virginia? No, sorry, I'm busy timing. <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay, our coaches. I was going to say quickly, see, I loved your speech, but I think the one that you're, you're very sincere, you're very warm, way you deliver it, so you drew us in, but I think one thing that I was not sure about is, is it good that <laughs> Five years ago, you didn't know where you'd be right now, or was it bad? Because it, it seemed like you appreciate a lot of the things about where you are, but then there was also once in a while some hesitation of maybe you weren't appreciating it. So I'd like to see a clear line in the sand of, hey, I love it like this, you know, it's, it's exciting, it's variety, or, hey, I don't like this at all, I'm sick and tired of it, and I'm right, you know. So one or the other, I kind of just wasn't sure which way it was going. Okay. Good speech. All right, we're going to move on to Pete Russell. And then this time we're going to start with any of our coaches that want to give Pete some feedback, and we'll start from front and then go to the back again. Coaches. You, the story, I like the way you, know, you interwove all of the, the food into your story. But I wanted to see more of your story, why, why you, you believe in this. Why is this an adventure? And one way to do that is maybe going back, when I was a kid, and then tell us a story like that, but, but make us reflect on our childhood or how we grew up. Did we enjoy different foods? And um, <coughs> so I think that that would make it a little bit stronger is to have more personal story and then how it, would, how it can reflect, how we can reflect on it and how we can think about it. Okay. Thanks, Bill. Seth? Yeah, be, uh, real quick, the payoff's about Food being the great equaling, you know, playing field. When you throw out your restaurants, maybe use foods of cultural groups in America that were at one time oppressed and now aren't. The Italians, the Irish, barbecue, and then you go from there with it. And that way you can talk about. It. And then kind of like what Valerie said, do some payoff. You know, I, I'm how a barbecue. I understand. Related. How is it my story? Yeah. How did I come to this? And how you get along with people? Because I'm a barbecue guy. You talk to the pit master. <laughs> Jerry goes with it too. You get to the pit master, that's all you do is talk about barbecue. Doesn't care if you're black, white, Chinese. You just talk about barbecue. All right, anyone else? Rick? Uh, very engaging in the beginning and on the adventure, but how you ended up getting to the cultural barriers, how food breaks that, I just didn't see a clearer path to that. So, I think the message at the end is great. I really do, and I think it's something we work with. But somehow in the beginning, we're getting all excited here, we're going to go to Paris, we're going to go all this. And at the end, you're talking about how the cultural barrier can do more than any legislation. It's really deep. So, I mean, I, I don't know how I got from there to there. That's well, just my opinion. So, better conclusion, and then also no, good another, conclusion. another opening. Well, i got to tie the conclusion to my story. Exactly. <laughs> Gina? I already gave her. Okay. okay. Sue? Uh, okay. I already talked. We already talked. Okay. Andrea? Um, one thing I was thinking, your, your title, Chill and Grillin', I wanted the barbecue in your backyard. I, I, I was waiting for that the whole story. And so I kind of like, uh, uh, one of the judges said something about, or, or some, uh, anyway, somebody up front, anyway, uh, how can you solve the world's problems? Or what's the fastest way to solve the world's problem? Because Cultural changes take forever in some ways, but then they're the most important. So you could also throw that piece in too. Sometimes it takes forever, but actually it could be pretty quick. It's just one dinner. But anyway, I, I don't know. The chili grilling, bring me to a barbecue for that one though. I'll do another speech on that. <laughs> yep. So there's a um, Toastmaster guideline that you tell everybody what you're going to tell them before you 
start your speech. And I just, I think you're, you're so creative, Pete, and you do this very often, is you kind of like, er, 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 and like all the dots are connected in your own brain, but I just didn't see a cohesiveness to the speech. Like you've got great elements, but. Got to tie it together. Yeah, the fluidity, and you thought of it last night, so. It was pretty darn Two good. seconds. Yes. I don't know. Did, 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 Pete get, did you get an introduction there and say Toastmasters? No, we didn't. No. Yeah. No. We're, we're, we're going to do a kind of a summary wrap up of some of the things that all the speakers and then we'll kind of, you know, go through that. Just real quick, you got to cut. If you were at 746. Yeah. Oh, and that's, that's what I was going to do. I was going to ask Virginia if she can actually give the speakers their times. Oh, she gave the others. Did you? Okay. All right. Was every Pete was overtime? Yes. Yeah. Okay, and what would just to let everybody else know, what was the time here for everybody? Bob was six twenty seven and Sue was five thirty eight. Okay. So Sue, you've got time to, to embellish. Oh by the way, uh, what great food did the Irish have? <laughs> Told you. <laughs> the masters of drinking beer. Man, I, man, I and pot roast. I'll take well, the no Lafayette. Doesn't, 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 doesn't that count? You start the target, beer. they call it the paddy wagon. <clears throat> Ooh. After the hey, great sauce. Ooh. <laughs> okay, we, we are we are already past past nine, but a couple quick a couple quick things, Seth, if you would. Just just to wrap up. Pass those out, and we can also pass those along. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hand out two other things to you. I've broken down for everyone. These are tips in order you can go home and you can read them, you can reflect on them, you can contemplate them. Tips to win the International Speech Contest. One of the things I wanted to say earlier, and, and several of our coaches have already brought it up, when we think about message, Valerie said it, John said it, Amy said it, Nick said it, and some of the feedback for all of you, it all begins with a message, i.e., the story. And I think one of the most important things for me, I know when I've competed, is that Virginia said this when she was talking about judges' training, it's to be true to who you are as a speaker, not try to be someone else because you can't be someone else. And be true to your own message. Have a conviction about your message because if you don't believe in you and your message, the audiences are going to believe in you and your message. And it doesn't matter what that is. So be true to your own self and your own message. And share that with an audience because whether it's Valerie or me or John, some of that audience, regardless of the topic or subject, needs to hear your message. Not mine, not Virginia's, not Seth, not someone else's, but your message. And there is a tendency in the International Speech Contest, and Virginia was talking about it earlier, and, and hopefully if you all are up for it, we're going to show you some clips from all the International Speech Contest winners. Just four clips. Just very short clips. So if you're up for it, we'll show them to you. But each one of those contestants had their own style and their own delivery. Some people are already talking about, well, I want to be like Prez. I'm like, no, you don't want to be like Prez. I want to be like such and such a speaker. No, you don't want to be like that speaker. Because you can't, you can imitate them. You can learn from some of their best techniques, strategies, tips, etc. But do not try to be like Prez. So unless you're from Bulgaria, and you have a strong accent, you're probably not going to, to mimic press. So that's the one thing that I want to share with you. The other thing is, by coming to a workshop like this, it's kind of a collective consciousness where we get to draw upon each other's experience and our knowledge. Each one of us has a different idea. We heard different opinions about the speeches because what I hear is different than what Andrea hears or Bob hears or Rick here or Roger hears. But the feedback is invaluable. Just like Press said, he went and visited five clubs. Monday night, well actually, who went, to, who went to see Ryan Avery? Okay, there was a number of us went to Ryan Avery. Val, tell them what he said about simplicity and brevity in terms of the story and the message. Oh, it just has to be one message throughout the whole thing. Um, one thing to start, to start with your message is to start with your message instead of working at the beginning and then the end is all 
doesn't match. So you have to start with your message at the end, what you want the audience to walk away with, and tie it back up to the beginning. A lot of people don't, they come down and then the, 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 the ending is blah. So start at the ending and tie it back up to the beginning of your speech. And then the word count. Do you know the word count? It was under 500. For press. For press. It was right. 400 and something. 400, 484 words. Many of the winners almost timed out. There, a lot of the champions right now almost timed out. And Darren LaCroix interviewed Prez, and he said that he learned something from Prez because Darren coached a couple of people, and they timed out. The, the, he, the people, two people he coached timed out. And Prez said, my speech was under five minutes. No, under no, six, six. No, under six, 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 eleven. Six eleven. Six eleven. But well under that. Yeah. Yeah, it was under five hundred words. And to Valerie's point, I mean, that's what I meant. The words. Right. Word count. He was talking about Monday night, so he took, he looked at third place, second place, and first place. So he was, he started with the third place. Her name was Farouk. She was from Dubai, and Virginia heard her in the semifinal. I didn't hear her semifinal speech. I saw her in the final. And Virginia said her semifinal was a much better speech. Farouk came in third place. 2013, same, same, you know, year for press. Her word count was 780 words. Second place was Kingy Biddle from New Zealand. His word count was 648. Press's word count was 484. You're going to see clips of those speeches. The one thing, if you watch them in their, their entirety, you'll notice, especially with press, he didn't speak in complete sentences. They were fragments. But as we all saw, those of us who watched his, his winning speech, the picture he painted, he didn't have to use complete sentences. Yeah. Indian hand, shakes Bulgarian hand, or right. something like that. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Under, you know, under the bright lights. He didn't need to say any more than that, it being under the bright lights. When he was talking about the gestures, when he was doing the jack. So everything was very calculated. You know, I always said Prez is very precise because he's very technical and he's very mechanical when it comes to he plans out every single thing. And when you hear, like Valerie saying, the world champions, because Valerie, she's a certified coach and she studied with Craig Valentine, it gets down to where now you're coming down to single words, your phrasing, your pauses, everything comes into play. And you mentioned preparation, which I want to emphasize that. Nobody gets to the World Championship without preparing, preparing, preparing. No one is going to win beyond probably area, certainly division, and not get to district unless you're willing to make the commitment to prepare, to prepare, to practice, to practice over and over and over again. And then the other thing that I wanted to share with you is that each time that you refine a speech and you revise it, every speech that we give, it evolves. It does not stay the same. Prez's speech when he started last year, it turned into a different speech at the very end. And every other, every other world champion would tell you the same <clears> thing. So you're always constantly revising, reworking, and that's where the feedback comes, in, comes into play. I wanna, uh, is it okay if we show you the clips? Do you wanna say a few extra minutes? Because I think you'll gain from that. And notice the commonalities and the similarities, because Val had mentioned, had mentioned about that. Oh, yeah. The clip runs, no, you don't need the lights, Jerry. No, 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 the clip lock. runs about 12 minutes all total. That's for all, that's for all. Definitely give them the lights. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Tim, stop that just for one second. The first one you're going to see is Mark Hunter. He's a 2009 world champion of public speaking. He's from New Zealand. The title of his speech is A Sink of Green Tomatoes. And he has a, he's physically challenged, you'll see. Our eighth speaker, Mark Hunter, a sink full of green tomatoes. 
a sink full of green tomatoes, Mark Hunter. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Literature is literally littered with lively legends. Amongst them rides Don Quixote, the man of La Mancha, an idealistic knight who fought for the rights of others and dared to dream the impossible dream. Madam Contest Chair, ladies and gentlemen, while I dare not sing that famous song for fear it could be your nightmare, I too, like all of us, have dreamed impossible dreams. But to make one of my dreams even remotely reachable, I needed to learn a lesson, perhaps a lesson for us all. My grandmother's kitchen was filled with the aroma of freshly cooked bread, and the quiet, rhythmic chopping of vegetables was the only sound to be heard. On the bench, gleaming upturned jars were just begging to be filled with a world-famous tomato relish. Well, I thought it was world-famous. My grandfather, Poppy, used to say it could be used as paint stripper. <laughs> <laughs> and so, with my new understanding, I began to change my world from in here. Ladies and gentlemen, in an ordinary kitchen, I learnt an extraordinary lesson. One which enabled me to take off my armor and get off my horse. Not literally. <laughs> I learned from my grandmother that it doesn't matter how we're different. What matters is how we love. And so this morning, I leave you with her wisdom. That in a sink full of green tomatoes and one wildly bright red apple, there is so much, so much to be gained from being the water. Madam Chairman. He is such a prince of a man. <laughs> Ryan Avery, Trust is a Must, 2012. I'm at the altar sweating in my wool suit. She is glowing in her white dress. Asks me the most important question of my life. Ryan, do you promise me? Before I make my commitment, I let my mind rewind like an old school VHS tape. And it takes me back to high school when I would plead with my mom to let me go to parties. Mom, please let me go. There'll be no alcohol, I promise. Mom in her nightgown and bunny slippers smiled sweetly. All right, I trust you. Mr. Contest Chair, fellow Toastmasters, anybody who's ever lied to mama before. <laughs> if you have ever worried about me smoking, don't. <laughs> Guys and I had to pick up five pounds of cigarette butts. Why, Ryan? There was alcohol at the party, Mom. Son, I'm disappointed. Worse, I can't believe you. Trust? is a must. Times have changed. When Dad and I were your age, we picked up seven pounds. <laughs> On the wedding, my mom reminded me, to me, that trust is a must if I want this marriage to last. I am at the altar, sweating in my wool suit. And Chelsea is glowing in her white dress. Chelsea, I promise. Game by title. Mention your name and open.
Prasiyan Vasilev changed by a tire. Changed by a tire, Prasiyan Vasilev. The steering wheel jerked. I tried to keep the car in control. That night in Chicago, a flat tire changed me. I pulled in the nearby gas station and on the bright lights, parked on a slope leading to a busy street. Mr. Contest Chair, Toastmasters and guests, have you ever done something stupid, loosened the nuts, placed the jack down? the rusty jack. Back at the trunk, I pulled out the spare tire, shook the entire car. I saw the car going downhill. <laughs> Bam! The jack collapsed. The car collapsed. My lungs collapsed. <laughs> an inner voice said, you are an idiot. <laughs> Then another voice, reach out, reach out, I can handle it. <laughs> Lifted the car almost enough, bang. If at first you don't succeed, <laughs> almost enough, bang. The car had moved to a steeper slope. I grasped the gravity of the situation. <laughs> the people at the bus stop <coughs> across the street were looking at me. I was giving a demonstration how not to change a tire. That to reach out was weakness. I discovered my weakness was refusing to reach out. When you reach out, you attract ideas and lift you up. When you reach out, you attract solutions that lift you up. When you reach out, you attract friendships that lift you up. Maybe you want a better voice. Reach out to a singer. Maybe you want better writing, reach out to a writer. Maybe you want better tire-changing skills, reach out to me. <laughs> I'll give you Jesse's number. <laughs> Is there something collapsed in your life? Your knowledge may be limited. Your skills may be rusty, but no doubt you'll be changed when you reach out. Mr. Chapman. Well, this is screaming that you hear in the background. Speaker number eight. The ultimate eight. question. Lance Miller. The ultimate question. The ultimate question, Lance Miller. Masters and friends, I was 26 years old. 
I was living in a small town in Indiana. I had a job I didn't like. I hadn't had a date in three years. And I had a couple of roommates named Mom and Dad. <laughs> I felt like my life was going nowhere. So I took control. I left my home and my family, and I headed to Los Angeles to start over. Six months later, I had a job I didn't like. <laughs> I was dating a girl who was trying to make me better by pointing out all of my faults. And I had a couple of roommates that made Dumb and Dumber look like Einstein and Oppenheimer. <laughs> the word stayed with me all the way home. And as I was looking at my life, I started to wonder how long it had been since I'd validated somebody else. I wanted to do that. I wanted to make people feel good. But I felt that I needed to be important. I needed to be successful. So that when I said something to somebody, it meant something to them. But that receptionist had just made my day. Heck, she made my month. We have a lot of problems in this world. But I've learned that there is not a problem that exists between a parent and a child, between a husband and a wife, between a worker and his employer, or between races, cultures, or nations that does not stem directly from an inability or an unwillingness to validate the rightness, the value, and the goodness in another. This is the ultimate question, do you validate? But this is not what's important. What's important is, can you cha? Can you cha? Can you cha? You've got a great audience. <laughs> You can watch these in their entirety, but if you look at each one of them, you probably notice there's a lot of similarities and commonalities, because if you look at their openings, what did they do at the very beginning? They immediately... They have thesis right away. Exactly. They immediately engaged the audience. Bam! They came right out there. Everything that they told, everything that they said, and the body of their speech supported the main story. And also the callback, whether it was Lance, whether it was Prez, whether it was Mark Hunter, you know, sink, a green, sink full of green tomatoes. And by watching those, you see, even though, again, like showing Mark Hunter, I was telling Tim when he and I were putting the clips together, the different styles. Each one had completely different styles. Mark Hunter being physically challenged. And he's just such a prince of a man. I had, to, I had a chance to meet him in 2011 when Perez and I went to Las Vegas to the convention. And talking about a Toastmaster willing to help someone else, after I met him in 2011, I emailed him. I said, Mark, it was, just, it was an honor to meet you. It was a privilege. And I just loved your, you know, your speech and, and everything, you know, watching it. The next day, I got an email back from him. He, he lives in Australia. But the next day, he answered my email. And then, you know, he and I were corresponding back and forth. And I think Valerie, she knows Craig Valentine very well. And I think that's true of most of the world champions. They will help us. You just have to, as press says, just reach out sometimes and ask for help. And they're more than willing to help you. So to wrap this up tonight, JP, do you have anything else to, you want to say? Yeah. A couple things. Um, why did I join TOP? Jerry went over a little bit of what the group was. I just want to take about 30 seconds and let you know why I joined TOP. When I got my competent communicator a little over a year ago, Amy said, great, you can join our advanced club. She told me where we met. She encouraged me to come. I came. Here's why I joined TOP. We have at least four people that are distinguished Toastmasters. I'm learning from some great speakers on a regular, every other week basis. I'm becoming better at presenting and doing what I'm doing because I'm learning from people. So if you've got your CC manual and you're thinking, how do I get better at making presentations? 
because we make presentations every day. It doesn't matter if you're sitting at work in a meeting training people. It doesn't matter if you're a salesman making a one-on-one -on -one presentation. It doesn't matter if you're customer service on the phone talking to a customer that you never see. You're making a presentation. Top is where you can learn to make great presentations regularly. And that's why I joined. Lastly, I just want to present to Jerry. Happy birthday. Thank you, JP. Many, many more. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. There's top flyers there. There's a membership application for Seth and for Pete and for Gina. You're welcome. Yes, if you didn't sign in, would you please? And also, everyone is welcome. You can come to top. You don't have to be a CC to come and deliver your speech. We'd be more than happy to help you. Seth attends the meetings regularly anyway as our area governor. And I guarantee you, you will get valuable feedback as, as John so eloquently said, we help one another, and that's the strength of the club, is that we really are interested in helping one another and see each other grow and learn and become better speakers. So thank all of you for coming again. Have a great rest of your week, and good luck to all of our speakers.